Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Hello Primo, there. DJ Premier. What's up? What's up? Uh, well, Welcome thanks, back. Thanks for having me back again. Of course. <laughs> I think this is the third time. Third time. You got a yeah. new project, Hip Hop Fifty. Yeah, it's uh, tell part, us about it. It's, uh, Mass Appeal, uh, the the label. Um, obviously, you know Peter Bittenbender and Nas are business partners, and they approached me about this ten producer EP where the the fir- the one through nine are producers that they chose to do a an EP that contains five songs mm-hmm. and. Uh, the ninth one is going to be voted by the fans, so mm. they'll get to say this is who we want to do. The tenth one, the tenth one's going to land on the on the fiftieth anniversary of hip hop, mm. which is August eleventh, you know, nineteen seventy three is the official birthday. So when the tenth one drops, it'll be on the fiftieth birthday. So we don't know who that's going to be. Since I guess they'll probably wait till they get closer to the end to let the fans choose. So like every two to three months, sort of, it'll be another one. Released, I think Swiss is next. Swiss is the next one. Yeah, it only it. makes sense, you Nas, you know, for you to kick things off. Yeah, well, I was I like, like, yo, well, we get to pick who we want. So I was like, Nas, I know you got to give me one. <laughs> like, I know you're part of the, the the company, but you got to give me at least one, and I'll f- figure out the other four. You got like an all star cast for these five <laughs> songs too, because you kicked it off with Joey Badass. Yeah, which I love. He's from Brooklyn. Love, and- love Joey, man. Badman. And then of course you put Remy Ma and Rhapsody together, which was a great matchup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I even I love this song with Slick Rick and Lil Wayne too. Yeah, yeah, that that was a last minute thing, but it, the dope part was Wayne had already laid his verse. So when I told Rick about it, and you know Rick, ah, let me hear the verse, see what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he talks just like the the way on uh, like the the children's story record. And I was like, as soon as he heard, it, he's like, oh yeah. He said, do you want a hook or do you want a verse or do you want a verse and a hook? I was like, I want both. And he said, all right, I'll, I'll do both of them. And Run the Jewels. <laughs> and then that. So those it? are the five songs. He did it in, maybe in like two or three days. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting to me because I feel like you have such a long history also in this game. You're from Houston, mm-hmm. but then you moved to by, New York. By way of Prairie View. A lot of, a lot of times I'll, the, it's it's left out, even though born born in Fifth Ward and lived there and, moved, and we moved to. My father was a, um, a biology teacher at Prairie View, mm-hmm. and that's how nice. we ended up moving there because... He he wanted to be closer to the to the college, which is only like a forty minute drive. So he built a house in that town, and that's how my family moved from Fifth Ward to, to PV. And I went to college there too. Didn't and, graduate. And then you moved to New York. Yes. Now, why did you move to New York? My grandfather lived in Brooklyn, uh, and and his, my mom, my mom, my mother, which is his father, um, which is her father, um, is from Baltimore. Okay. So every summer, my whole, you know, you know, after school, that like, oh, we're going to New York for the <laughs> summer, and you know, as kids, we're like, yeah, we're going to New York. So we'd always, then my father's from South Carolina, she's from Baltimore, so we always stop in South Carolina and something to see my family there, which is the Martin family. Then we we go to North Carolina to see our aunt and my uncle. Then we go we go to, and that's driving. Mm-hmm. Then we go to Baltimore see my grandmother and my aunt <laughs> and my cousin. Then we, New York is the finale. So we always stayed with my grandfather, Grandfather Bill, who's tatted on my arm because he was a major part of me wanting to be in the music business. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> he was in bands and stuff. He used to brag and show me his photo albums of all the places he'd been, and mm-hmm. I was just really into that. And I was really into uh, video, <laughs> I guess you can't really call them video games in my age since I'm 56. We, I was a pinball expert. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's not video game. That's, what, <laughs> yeah. what do you call it? Do you, yeah, you yeah. don't call that video game, yeah, right? I, I, yeah. What do you call? What do you call? I don't know. Arcade. Okay. Arcade. Arcade. Really yeah. arcade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Arcade games. So I was always battling people in pinball. So whenever I'd go to stay with my my grandfather, um, and this is right before I was like maybe 11 or 12, because as I got older and like turned 13, 14, I, my my sisters and them didn't want to go anymore. They're like, <laughs> we want to have summer with our friends, and I'm going to keep going to New York. Me, I wanted to go because. He was into baseball. We would go to baseball games. That's how I got into the Yankees, even though I'm still a diehard Astros <laughs> fan for life. I'm, I'm Houston everything for life on that. But when it came to my grandfather, um, <clears throat> he, we would always go to Playland in Times Square, and I would he'd give me mad rolls of qu- um, quarters, and I would just battle people in pinball, say, I'll play, I'll play you, I'll play you. <laughs> and I just loved the whole action of the city. And being that he went to, I was in Tokyo, I was here, and he's showing all these pictures. I was like, man, I want to do that one day. One day he takes me to Playland, and uh, we see some B-boys breaking and stuff. You know how they put the guitar case open to put money in? Yep, yep, yep. 
You put your quarters in there? Yeah. They, they, <laughs> well, just seeing all, you know, I didn't know what break dancing was and just seeing all that and they playing the hip hop and they got the big boom box. And I was like, this is different because growing up in my era, we, we liked our parents' music. You know, now as, mm-hmm. you, you know, my son is 11, he's not really into the music I'm into because the generation is different. But for me, us, we were into Gladys Knight and, you know, Curtis Mayfield, Barry White, you know, The Temptations. We weren't like, ah, that's your old folks' music. We all grew liking our parents' music right. mm-hmm. until Prince comes out and, you know, uh, the Confunction and, you know, Cameo. And we start to kind of, my mom was like, ah, eh, that's your all's music. And we separate. But when I saw them doing all that breakdancing in, in Times Square, I was like, I want to move here. Mm. And then as it built and hip hop started to grow and then records started coming out, I was like, man, that's me. I could just totally identify. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Did you listen to disco too? Since Did your parents yeah. listen to that? Yeah. Yeah, that was, a, even that, I mean, you as a DJ, mm-hmm. the 12-inch single, I mean, to get a Rapper's Delight or anything like that, you had to only buy a 12-inch. Mm-hmm. There weren't no cassette singles yet. There was no CDs. Mm-hmm. You would do, even if you didn't have a turntable, you bought Record. Uh, the record, just yeah. to say, I own Rapper's Delight, you know. But so. well, we had we had turntable. It wasn't twelve hundreds, but we no. always had we always had a turntable <laughs> yeah. at the crib. Yeah, mother always had, at home. Mom, yeah, mom yeah. always had a turntable at yeah. the crib. That's like me TV in the basement yeah, listening the to. Um, yeah. I used to put my headphones in and just listen to records on the turntable all day. Yeah. So so even with that, um, as it grew, I was like, man, I'm gonna move here. So in '87, I started to make my move, and I was still checking my staying with my grandfather. Then he passed. Once he passed, I moved in with one of my classmates' parents who uh, went to Prairie View with us. They were from Brooklyn. And that's how I ended up in East New York and really deep in the hood and and be, hanging around all these wild guys. And then you kind of start to blend in and become part of them. Some of them were just wild and crazy. I was, I loved the action being from a, a, a smaller town. And then, you know, I ran the streets, did all the crazy stuff, but not to the degree of where it would get back to my father finding <laughs> out that I was doing doing stuff. So it was like a gumbo of music. You had your yeah. taste from Houston and mm-hmm. South Carolina and North Carolina yep. and Maryland mm-hmm. and and heavy metal. I remember mm-hmm. seeing oh, somewhere yeah. that you used to listen to heavy metal. I lo- still do, still do. <laughs> I love love rock. I love jazz. And my mother's an art teacher, so mm-hmm. she uh, she taught all of us art. And because of that, that's another reason why I was into vinyl because she had so many different types of records. And then me and her would go record shopping, and we went to concerts together. You know, so anything that had to go to concerts, my mother and I would always go. We we'd go see Shaka. It was Rufus at the time, mm-hmm. featuring Shaka mm-hmm. Khan. We uh, our whole family went to see Ike and Tina Turner, and I was that's you know, amazing. And I got lost. Uh, you, you know how you in your seats, but if you go in, you, there's always an aisle that separates each row. Yep. <laughs> I'm dancing, doing my thing. <laughs> I kind of move to the left, and you know they're not they're not looking. They're watching the show. And as I drift out of the, the, the aisle that takes the stairs all the way down to the bottom row of, the, of that section, I ended up in the wrong one. So now I'm looking like... You cried. Yeah. yeah I, I, I remember the first time I, mom, I lost my mom in TSS. Boy, did I cry. Yeah, you got me. I, I, I used to get lost all the time, but like on purpose, and I never was upset about it. What? And then my parents would be going crazy looking for me. I would be crying. And then next you know, I show up with a cop bringing me. Yep, they'd have to <laughs> and then they the feel irresponsible. Janet <laughs> Casey, your son is here. We have your son. <laughs> that, that's, what? that's what happened to hey, The crazy thing is, you know, the usher's like, where you, you don't know? And I'm like, no, okay, Papa Bobby. <laughs> and they tell, they have to go make an announcement to Tina. So they stop the music and they go, no. we have a little boy so lost. So on the stage? Yes. So <laughs> Tina Turner knows you. Had to make the announcement. This little boy and, lost messing and, up my and they, show. they found me and, uh, and uh, my mother's boy, boy, you don't <laughs> you get it when you get home. So my mother was a disciplinarian. My father was the extra disciplinarian. But my mom was the one that, that taught me how to throw my hands up if I got into a fight, everything. So Go get your shoes. We got to fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I learned early, you know, to be a stand-up guy because of, of my mom. And on top of that, don't you move out of that aisle no more when you're at a mm-hmm. concert. So shout to, Ike, shout to Ike and Tina. Have you seen that challenge going around? The, the challenge with the parents and telling their shoes. kids go get your shoes yeah, and have a fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, now it's saw, funny. A lot, saying Rollins, is, a lot of people saying is, is disrespectful, right? <laughs> yep. But it's... I'll be honest, that's what I teach my kids. I teach Mm. my kids, if mom or dad or your brother or sister have a problem, you put your shoes on and you got to help your family. Yeah. So it's like I tested one of my kids the other day and, you know, he was like, all right, put my shoes. He's like, all right, we got a problem, dad, let's go. But that's (laughs) That's what you want. That's what my dad taught me. It's traumatizing for the kids who start crying and then they're posted on social media forever. It wasn't too crying. I literally (laughs) just saw it uh, just flashing the TV and TMZ was on and they, they were 
they were showing Donnell Rollins, mm -hmm. asking his son to do it. And even though he 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 walked off and went back, they went like at the airport and scene, like he walks back in, like I'm not doing it, or whatever. And then they show the people on, you know, the staff on TMZ, and they were, and the girl was going, "That's wrong," and she was like, that, that, "You shouldn't do that," and you know, with the whole mm -hmm. energy of like, "That's not cool." Mm -hmm. And I, but uh, Donnell did it, and someone was like, "Yo, of I'm sticking did, with my yeah. pops." So he, when he walked off, he thought he was gonna run, but he he stayed there. You know, so I'm sure Donnell's teaching. But that's what my dad told me. My dad worked a lot, and he was he always told me, "If something happens with your mom, mm -hmm. you have her back. You Absolutely. make sure she's good." If I'm not here, and same thing with my grandmother. I stayed with my grandmother the whole summer, and my cousins. But they were they always taught, "If y'all get beat up." If yeah. won't get a black eye, y'all all better have a black eye. And plus, Donnell's son, Austin, probably is going to have to protect him one day soon. Because I don't know if y'all seen <laughs> Donnell fight, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. But, <laughs> but yeah, but. so let's get back into your story, though. So you're in Brooklyn, right? Mm, yeah. And, and so the first artist that you produced for, was it um, for Gangstar for Guru? Um, Gangstar, as far as uh, joining the that group, was I was in a group called... Uh, we, we, we used to be called MCs in Control. It was uh, my man Topski. Sugar Pop mm -hmm. and Styly T. Styly Great T names. was our was our was <laughs> right? our, he was our like flavor flavor of the group. This is all college buddies from school. And um as it got to the point where we wanted to see if we could make it in New York, the only ones that could really afford to go was me and Top, because Top happened to be from Boston. So he would always always go visit his pops and and uh, and his, the reason why he was in Houston is because his mother lived in Mo City, which is if anybody text knows that's Missouri City, but we call it Mo City. So we would always go to her house during the summer or uh, we'd be up in New York. When I was trying to shop my demo, I was working at a record store in Houston uh, called Soundways. It was the store in the hood that everybody, the pimps would come to. They'd come in there with the gators and the hat, cock, days, deuce, and, and just, you know, with the gold, one gold, two, going, hey, man, you got that ladder mo? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't even say ladder more. They say ladder mo. <laughs> and and it, you had to know every genre of music, and you had to know Zydeco music, which you know is you know the Cajun music with the kind of the accordion sound. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Oh, I definitely did. It's know that. big down there. Look up Zydeco; <laughs> it's super big. It's like very New Orleans, uh, but it Texas is big, <clears throat> and and it's very heavy out there. You everybody knows the words to everything. Mm. Like a like a like a, a before I let go from Maze, they know the words to every Zydeco record. So we grew up with that. The boss at the, at the store said, you have to know all that, including country as well and jazz. So I had a good knowledge of it because of my mother's record collection. And as that built, uh, I was telling the guy that, that got me the job, his name is Carlos Garza. He's a big part of me getting here because uh, hip hop was just going on Billboard. They, they were having, a, you know, finally had a hip hop uh, chart. Mm -hmm. He became the Billboard reporter. So he had me become the 12 inch buyer for all the 12 inch records that come wow. in. So, so that he could do occupy that, and they're, they're checking, hey, what's popping in, in Houston? Oh, this record, this record, this record, and a lot of independent hip hop were called to get on that chart by having him report from Houston. While he was doing that, he's like, yo, man, you gotta check out this friend of mine. He could DJ, he's dope, and he's coming to New York for the summer. Stu Fine, who owned Wild Pitch Records, which Gangstar was on at that time, was like, hey, we, uh, uh, we wanna hear the demo. I wasn't ready to, for him to hear it, he, t he sent them a copy of it, and I was like, why'd you do that? It's not ready yet, and, and they heard it, and they, he, they liked it, but they didn't want them. They only wanted me, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, I'm not going to go without my, my group because I was even not even contemplating being in a group, but I DJed all the parties at school, so everybody was like, yo, you should do it. You should do it. Finally got my courage up to say, all right, we get to, we get to New York. He's like, I don't like your MC, but I'll put you in a real studio and let's see if you can do a better demo that, and maybe I'll like him and we could, we're interested in signing you. We put they put us in the studio, still didn't like it. Top, Top was like, "Yo, man, if things don't work out in the next couple of months, I'm going to join the military." And Top's a wild dude. Mm -hmm. I'm like, "You ain't joining no military. That's not even your style. You you too street for that." And he's like, "Yeah, I'm going to do it." One day when it was a weekend and we're, we're all living at my man Gordon Franklin's parents' house. He made us get jobs, everything. He said, you can't stay. And they're all trendy, so you know. Mm -hmm. You have to have a job. <laughs> and he said, you, know, you can't Several. stay here, man. You know, so and, and only we could, we couldn't come until like up to five. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we get get home at night from uh, having to stay there. And, I mean, get, we get home at night and then we got to stay out until he gets back from work. So we have nowhere to go. So I was like, I can't keep doing this. That one Saturday, uh, when we're chilling, the doorbell rings and the recruiting officers in the outfit. Wow. He goes, hey, how you doing? We're looking for Theodore Campbell. And I was like, for what? 
He goes, oh, today is the day. He's he's joining the Navy. And I'm like, no way. And I'm like yelling down the basement, yo, top, yo, top. <laughs> and he comes up the stairs like, yo, man, I told you. You know, it's, we nobody's, they're not interested in us. Uh, I'm gone. And I'm like, how long are you gone for? He said four years. Wow. wow. I'm like, oh, I'm not waiting. If he had said a year, I 100% was going to wait. He said four years. I'm like, dude. He said, no, nah, do your thing. I'm riding with you. He's he's my boy to this very day. We talk all the time, bug out. And uh, next thing you know, uh, he's gone. I called back to Stu and said, yo, Top just went. They just The recruiting officer just took him. And he's like, so will you join Gangstar? And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah. And that's how I became the DJ. Me and Guru started just talking on the phone because I had to go back to school to get, get another semester in. I made him beat to words on manifest and said, I think this would be dope for you to rhyme over. He called me back and said, yo, I, I just wrote a rhyme, check it out. And he's like, I profess it not on jazz for the words. I, mean, I was like, ooh, because mm-hmm. they were already, Gangstar was already out, and I, I was a fan of some of their 12-inch singles when 45 King was producing them. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then from there, uh, you know, and, and then I was a fan of La T, who was on Wild, Wild Pitch as well, who is Apache's brother, and uh, La T was one of the first, and Chill Rob G. So mm-hmm. all of that, and that was all 45 King flavor unit stuff. Guru was the only outsider that was on that label at the time. And I was like, man, we, this could work. We we recorded the record. Stu calls me back and is like, yo, <laughs> it's popping on radio. Everybody's playing it. He said, but your version on the album is a little too slow. We need to make a more amped, maybe speed it up. I flew back there right before Thanksgiving, recorded the record and did the, the extended one, which everybody knows from the video. He said, we're doing a video, and back then, you're like, oh, we're going to get a video. Right. Mm-hmm. And we shot the video, and then it just really took off. How was the money for you back then in deals that you signed? Was Zero it Zero broke, you wow. know. And after we made a name for ourselves, then uh, Guru, Guru used to listen to all the demos. So he, he would go to Stu's house. It was a husband and wife label, and he'd have the uh, shoebox of tapes. And when he heard my demo, the, uh, the second demo he found was Lord Finesse. Mm. And Lord Finesse's demo, he's like, yo, I'm trying to talk to Stu into signing this guy, Law Finesse. Let, tell me what you think. I just found Law Finesse's demo that that I, that we that he played me, and I found I got my demo back from <laughs> Stu. He gave me my demo back, so I'm digitizing all that stuff That's so I amazing. can tell a story later on. But <clears throat> we listened to Law Finesse, and he said, Stu, Stu was like, "Should we sign him?" I'm like, "Yes, yeah, sign him." So Law Finesse was the first artist I produced outside of Gangstar, and he became my label mate. And Law Finesse brought Diamond D. Mm-hmm. He said, I, I, I got to have my homies from my block. He brought Diamond, he brought Showbiz, and he brought Fat Joe, and AG. He brought all of them around. So wow. that's how I met, met them. This is like, this is 80, 89. Wow. And you were supposed to produce Fat Joe's project or the Terror Squad project. What was it that? No, he signed uh, <clears throat> uh, He signed me to Terror Squad. Uh-huh. And we were supposed to do a, a project. It's kind of like what I did with this, uh, like a compilation album, like the way Khaled does albums, okay. his features. And... Uh, um, but then, then when show, I mean, when uh, Fat Joe left, um, I had it in my contract that if he leaves, I can leave because they wanted it to where even if Joe leaves and goes somewhere else, we still got to keep you at the label. And I wanted the freedom to bounce if Joe bounced. So the first single I was gonna drop was a fifty cent record. Mm-hmm. Wow! And this is when everybody wouldn't really mess with Fifth to the fullest because you know he was having so much drama from after doing How to Rob, mm-hmm. and me and Fifth hit it off right right away uh, and clicked when I got on the phone with him. He said he'll do the record, and right when it's about the time to do the record, boom, we get a call. And Fifth can't do it, I'm, and then I'm like, why not? They like. He's about to sign to Eminem and Dr. Dre. And I'm like, no, because yeah, yeah, yeah. he already committed to us. And they're like, nah. He And I talked to Dre. Dre was like, Kareem, I love you, but he's not doing any more recording until he does his debut album. Which, Well, not his debut, because obviously Power of the Dollar is the debut, but sign to them, get Richard Dodd trying, and look what happened. Wow, you know me and me, I always tell Fit you still owe me that track. So. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you do. I, I think you're gonna, get, I think you're gonna do one last. Yeah, I need album. you, Fifth. What's up? <laughs> now, I, yeah. I was gonna ask when, when you and Guru first met. How was it? Because you know you're coming from Houston, mm-hmm. him coming from Boston. Yeah, different slangs, different sounds. Mm-hmm. How did y'all connect? Um, just phone calls, and actually, it was doing a mu- new music seminar, so everybody was in town. And we, I was a starstruck. There goes Ice T. There goes there goes Chuck and Flav, mm-hmm. and you know, just just everybody. You know, it, it was you couldn't it, it, going to the battle, the DJ battle, and the MC battle, and then. Um, uh, we went to the world. They had a showcase. There's a lot of showcases. Mm-hmm. And the showcase, I remember it was Ice Cream Tea. Remember her from, uh, mm-hmm. she was, it was a strong city. Record shout to Jazzy J. And uh, it was Ice Cream Tea. 
and uh, Busy B, that's when Suicide was out. I remember he brought Melly Mel on to to uh, to rock on stage with him, and he was like, when I was a young boy, and Melly Mel was flexing, I'm like, wow, it's Melly Mel. <laughs> and then Cool G Rap and Polo performed after that. Wow, that's And for me, at that time, when Ro- and this is when Road to the Riches was, was out, mm-hmm. and I was just like, I gotta, I gotta be here. I gotta get on. And I remember my father was like, "Hey, if you uh, if you're gonna stay out there and not finish school, please make a name that people remember." He said, "He said I'm I'm counting on you to keep our name hot." And I was like, "All right, I'm gonna definitely do it. You'll see." And me and Groove would just talk about we everything we had in common, the artists we liked, mm-hmm. you know, smoking blunts, you know, just just everything mm-hmm. was just so exactly in sync. Now I was gonna sense. ask with with um. B.I.G. and Jay-Z. Mm-hmm. How did you develop those relationships? Uh, I know you talked about it before, but right. in depth. And also with like one in a million and the beats changing. Mm-hmm. You know, did he always agree with that or was he like, I don't know. So talk about that, the first call with, with, when you got in the studio with Big and who called? Well, with Big, we we lived right down the block from him. That's how we met. Mm-hmm. Guru was the one that's going, yo, you got to check out this guy, Biggie Smalls. And it wasn't big, you know, it wasn't big, it was just Biggie Smalls. And I got to credit Mr. C because Mr. C lived down the block from us. And there was and there was a weed spot down down near where he lived at the time that had just opened. And any time back then in those days, since we were all promoting, get, you know, uh, getting lifted, um, you would go to the the the, the new spot. To hopefully, they, they got some good good, you know. Mm-hmm. So every time you, we went to the spot, we'd either go down the block that where C lived about his church, or and make the so we could park somewhere away from the spot, go go get get our stuff and move on. And every time I'd see Mister C, he'd go, "Yo." Biggie Smalls, when you gonna listen to that demo? And I was like, yo, I'm gonna listen to it. Brushed it off. Right. Going to the spot again. You know, and we're rolling. Mr. C just happened to always be out outside. Mm-hmm. Yo, Biggie Smalls. And he would do that every time. Biggie Smalls. And we're just like, okay, okay, okay. Chilling at the crib because we lived in Branford Marcellus's crib on, on Washington between Lafayette and Green. Um, because he was moving out and he wanted somebody to rent the brownstone. He was trying to sell it, but he said just somebody to rent it. Me and Guru to, moved in together and rented it. So every every day, pretty much, I was gonna say every weekend, but every day, we always going to buy forties mm-hmm. and we'd go to Fulton and Washington where Big and them always hanging out. So Guru's like, "You got to check out this dude, Biggie Smalls." I'm like, "Yo, C been pressing me about that." Mm-hmm. All right, I'm gonna go with you. I go down to the corner. He, that's why he's, the the documentaries they've done on him. I said he had on the green army jacket mm-hmm. and the hat. That's what he had on. And I'd go down there. We met the whole junior mafia. We met Kim, uh, uh, Chico, uh, Nino, Del Vec, Clep, D Rock, Gutter, everybody. They'd be there every day just on that corner. We'd drink 40s together, smoke together. And as that built, he was like, yo, Puff is interested in signing me. He hadn't even signed him yet. Mm-hmm. And he, I was like, yo, go with Puff. He's going to blow you up. He's, look what he did with Uptown and Jodeci and all that. He's like, but I want to get signed now. Why can't you sign me? I'm like, dude, he's already in a different pocket. We're just good on a, on a certain level. We're not even platinum artists to even be able to sign you like that. And I was like, Puff going to put you where you need to be. And as time passed, uh, I remember I met Mark, his, Mark Pitts, his, his manager. He, he was like, yo, you think this guy should sign with this guy for management? I was like, yo, Mark kind of a little bit resembles Yeah, he Puff. looks like him. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I said, give him a shot. I mean, if it don't work, you fire him. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, Gooch is uh, is his, uh, his manager, and, and we all were cool. And uh, so as it built up, we were one of the first ones to get his demo, the Big Mac, mm-hmm. the, 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 I remember the cassette. That, yeah, yeah, Craig Mac and Big Mac. At yeah. that time, remember, it wasn't warning. It was called Hot Butter Soul because mm-hmm. they, you know, from the, from the record that Easy Mo B sampled. So that's how early it was to hear Warning. And all his homies had it, the whole Junior Mafia had it, because back then in, in the 90s, you know, you want your friends to already have your stuff before it drops. You know, now we're afraid of leaks. Yeah, you don't want anybody mm-hmm. to Yeah, have it. but your team, you want them knowing, and they knew the words to everything. And uh, so from there, as he updated it and started finishing up Ready to Die, uh, he was dropping Juicy as a single, and he said he's one song shy of just having a street record for for the streets. Ten Crack Commandments. No, no, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, uh, Crack Commandments was the was next album, life after yeah, death. Okay. So from there, we uh, I told him that I don't have time to do it right now, and I was like, man, maybe next time on your next album. And he goes, yo, man, it's the last one. And he said, I'm, I, my budget's already run over. I got five thousand dollars. At that time, I was making. <laughs> Like twenty, 
<laughs> a track. You were like five thousand yeah, dollars. I was like big, and, but, but big was such the that's was a such nice a homie. <laughs> I was like, I'll do it for five thousand. I said, I don't know what I'm gonna come up with because everybody knows I make my songs on the spot. He goes, I don't care what you use. Let's just, I don't care if it's in piece of present, whatever. I'm coming up. He comes to D and D. I cook it right there on the spot. He's the one that told me to do all the boop doo boop doo and all the different things. I, I did it to his instruction, you know, which I don't like people telling me to. What but, to do, yeah. but Big always had his stuff mapped out on how he wants to do it. Did the record, boom. We uh, we, we turn it in, and I've told this story before where I'm driving, and uh, I know this is power, so I, it was on another it's station. Good. You can say okay. facts. It's all good. We're riding, and uh, this is maybe two days after. We're rolling and and uh, we hear it blasting out of somebody's car. We, we get about to get on the Brooklyn Bridge over by the by the uh, by um, all the courthouses, and we, you know it's that's, it's almost like a dead end. You have to make the left to get on the bridge. Mm -hmm. As soon as we're trying to pull up, I'm trying to get up on the guy before he can get past me because once you're on the bridge, you might go too fast, and I can't be going yo. So right when we're about to, to to make the left, I pull up on him. I go yo yo, wh wh where you get that from? He goes, it's on I-97, Flex is playing it right now. <laughs> and I go, wow. And I was like, we just made an acetate. He, Flex had the acetate, you know, which, <clears throat> you know what acetate is? Mm -hmm. That's a, a dub plate. <clears throat> uh, you know what a dub plate is? It's like a is real thick you, record that uh, yeah, you yeah. shouldn't really be DJing right. with. It, you know what I mean? It, and it's, yeah, every like, time you play it, the, <clears throat> the quality gets worse and worse and worse. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really just to test out a song when you get something mastered. So, um, They'll give you a dub plate just to test it and play it on a turntable. If you like it, then they start pressing the massive copies of vinyl. Ooh, times have changed. Yeah, and well, yes. the, well, 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 Jamaican. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. That's why I know dub they, plates. Yeah, from. the same thing. It's mm -hmm. just they'll do the ten inch ones that are smaller. You can play them a lot more times. Where and that's and it's an instant record. Just right there, you put it on a thing called a cutting lathe, put it on there, run the song, and you already have, and you can play it right away. You know, before taking it to a plant. So. To have a dub plate on a 12 inch, like you said, mm -hmm. you can't even wind it back. It's mm -hmm. that heavy. You got to kind of just push it. Yeah, just push it. Yeah. yeah. So hearing that, and they said, "Yeah, Flex got that. Got the acetate. It's called an acetate." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Flex got the acetate." So I was like, "Wow, man, it might pop off." And next thing you know, unbelievable was just summertime. That and Juicy together. And then what know? about Hove? How, how, how did you do Hove? And and you know. Uh, some of your projects with him. Jay, with, with, with a million and one questions, the crazy thing is uh, he called me and said, I want to do this song that intros vol uh, In My Lifetime Volume 1. He did the rhyme over the phone and, and said, just like he did with the Evils, he did the rhyme over the phone and said, I want, he, he said, I want these scratches here, and I did the scratches to his instruction. Same thing with a million and one. He said, he didn't tell me the scratches. He just said, I wanted to go into another song that's going to be called Rhyme No More. He said, but I need you to think like this. When I say motherfuckers can't, you got to have something that just jumps out when I say rhyme no more. And he said, so split them. He said, and he said, those little breakdowns you do, mm -hmm. do a breakdown so we can weave them together as one song. I said, okay, got it. I go to D&D &D to start cooking the first one. Jay walks in with Too Short. And I'm like, oh, shit, Too Short's in D&D? <laughs> right, right, right. You know, which, which we have been knowing each other mm -hmm. for years already but because of Gangstar's history, but... See, you know, Dempsey coming to D&D &D was yeah. like a big deal, especially for the streets. And Short was there to do a week ago. Mm -hmm. So they were going, they were in run room working on that. And Jason, I said, he said, when you get the first half, let me know. I'll just come in and record it. I got the first half. Yo, come listen. Him and Too Short come in there and listen. And he, I said, you ready? And I, for some reason, uh, Leah, a million, in, a, one in a million, which is one of my favorite Timberland produced songs, just came to my mind just on some DJ shit. Like, mm -hmm. And I put it in. He didn't have that. He, he didn't know I was going to do that part. Loved it right away. He said, turn the mic on. Cut that one. I'm going back in there with Short. I work on Round No More. Got it. And then and when I come in there, Jason, I say, I got it. He says, do not press that play button until I say, because I, I got to make sure it's the right vibe. He said, I'm going to say motherfuckers can't, and then you hit it. I said, all right, and I'm just waiting. He goes, motherfuckers can't. Boom. And he was like, oh, that's it. And he, he said, turn the mic on and cut it. So that's one of my favorite records because of like the story I'm telling y'all mm -hmm. was dope. And Too Short was there to witness it. And uh, it's just, just that was just an amazing thing. And, you know, Jay always came and got me for whatever for every album. So Out of all the artists that you work with, who is probably the most amazing in the studio? Who's your top three, if you can only name three? 
as far as you're surprised with the way they write or how they do it or how they record or how professional they are, the <clears> ideas? I got to say KRS-One for sure because mm-hmm. for him giving me the opportunity when I wasn't really producing a lot of artists on his level, um, he reached out to me and said, I'm doing this new album, Return of the Boom Bap. Or like KRS, I'm doing a new album, <laughs> Return of the Boom Bap. You know, he t- talks to you the same way. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like he's lecturing you and shit. And uh, I was like... Uh, so that was just a, a dope opportunity, and it's the, that was '92. That was when I started to be confident that anybody that calls me, I, I'm, I'm in. I could, I could produce anybody. Guru, I always put number one because mm-hmm. I could experiment with beats that I, other people would definitely not take. Like, mm-hmm. like Robin Hood Theory on the Moment of Truth album. Always loved the beat. I knew he'll mess with it, and he did write a dope rhyme to it. And, and uh, um, KRS, <clears throat> um, Guru. Man, cause yeah, cause Jay was fun, Big was fun, Nas, Nas is another one that was fun just because he always visualized what he what he wants, especially when I gave you power. Mm-hmm. I want to do a song like if I was a gun and somebody like found it and picked it up and misused it, and already I'm just like, and this is after we done New York State of Mind and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> so with that, I was like, that would be crazy to do a record like that, and. Look what it turned out to be. At the time, it was called Gun. Mm-hmm. And then we changed it to I Gave You Power. Because he said he didn't want it to just say Gun on the track list when he did it. But, yeah, he was... I, I, I don't want <clears throat> to keep saying, you know, Biggie J and Nas, but they were all fun sessions. You gotcha. know what I'm saying? They were really fun sessions. And a lot of laughing, a lot of bottles everywhere, mm-hmm. and a lot of trees. Now, you also did a, a Gangstar album not that long ago. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about the process of that? Because clearly you had some vocals or were able to get your hands yeah. on some things. I know that was a whole process for yeah, you. Yeah, I, I bought vocals from his business partner. You know, I don't like to say his name because mm-hmm. we just don't click. Mm-hmm. And um, and the crazy thing is um, I'm Pro Tools savvy, but not to the degree of where I see the part where you can, you can check date created. And, and when you look at some of the dates created, the, some of the stuff I bought – were not from the era of when they would have been recording. They were someone from 99, 2000. We didn't, mm-hmm. they, none of us knew that guy then. Oh, so, so that means he got those <clears throat> from somewhere. In- well, I figure when Guru was sick or whatever, plus his house burned down <clears throat> in some type of way when he was in the hospital, maybe. I mean, again, it's all alleged, but somehow they were in his possession. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? We don't know if he got them prior to it, you know, prior to the house burning down. Who knows, you know, but at the end of the day, we negotiated a price. I bought them, did paperwork to make sure everything was airtight. Right. I have good, I have good lawyers, which I'm sure you all, I know you do. And you're working with <clears throat> Guru's family, also. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Mm-hmm. They, they, we, we have a great relationship. Uh, his son is now, you know, 21, so he's uh, actually in charge of the estate. He was always in charge of the estate with his mom. Shout to Lana, uh, and uh, he uh, now, you know, has meetings with us. Says, and he, he's into fashion like Guru was. So he has a lot of dope ideas, like, we should do this, we should do this. And he's at the age. I remember when the Guru passed and he was nine years old, I was getting him, uh, shout to Mosh, I was getting him certain sneakers made. And he asked me when he was nine years old, he said, yo, when I get older, can I pitch into business ideas? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> and now he'll he'll present stuff that's dope. Well, I'll check this out, check this out. We'll you know check the companies and make sure they're legit. But he brings dope stuff to the table. That's dope. And uh, you, you, we st- we uh, handle business with Guru's sister. Shout to Trish, uh, Guru's uh, uh, son's mom, and also his nephew Justin, who's the one that went on YouTube to expose the guy about all the stuff that was going on mm-hmm. that we didn't know about because I hadn't seen Guru in, in a couple years. So with that, once we all teamed up and started the business, I said, uh, let's let me see if I can put an album together. And I just pulled it up. I had about 30, you know, unused tracks. Some of them were not the guru, the flow and stuff that I like and know that's him. Mm-hmm. But the ones that really stood out, I'm like, that's one, that's one. Started putting beats inside and matching things. And, you know, as a DJ, we, mm-hmm. we do acapellas with mm-hmm. beats and, mm-hmm. and see if it flies. Put the, I put in my Serato, fly it in. Yeah, that's dope. Dump it, make a beat. And we, we came together and put out one of the best shit, which did very well for us and it also fed the family very well so and it made the other previous albums uh just get more stream yeah thanks thanks to j cole man because when we were dropping the uh family and loyalty cole was the one that's like first thing he asked me he said how did y'all do y'all's promo back in the 90s and i told him how we did it 
He goes, do that. And, he, and I said, because we always drop a street record first, radio record second, every time. Yep. Boom. Maybe a week or two passes, we're getting ready to set up the single, Bad Name. Cole calls me out of the blue and goes, yo, uh, that thing I told you about how you set up your 90s era uh, of promo, don't do that. He said, I think you need to drop mine first. And I'm like, yeah, but that's more for radio. He goes, listen, I have a fan base that has no idea who y'all are. He said, I want you to take advantage of that time with me to pop that off. And they might go, oh, I like this one with Cole. Oh, let me look at these other Gangstar albums. Oh, man, this is hot. This is hot. Oh, man, I like Gangstar now. Mm -hmm. So he said, that, that I thought about it. I was like, wow, he, made, he has a point. So I, we switched it and made that the first record. <laughs> And it worked all out. So shout to Cole, man. One thing I would say about Cole is shout to Cole. He's he, Cole is a student to the game. It doesn't matter how much money Cole has, how Facts. many fans. Cole really loves those conversations. Mm -hmm. Like the how. Yeah. How did you start to mix there? I remember Cole called me one day and it, out the blue. And he was like, yo, Envy question. He was like, how did you get all the records from your mixtapes back then? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> how did you get the songs? <clears throat> I was like, well, sometimes I paid interns. Right. I said, sometimes, you know, I, I remember we, we got a Biggie song. Uh, it was a valet guy. Mm. And the valet was parking Biggie's truck. Right. And Biggie had the CD at the time listening to his own music. Mm. And the valet guy stole it and sold it to me. Like, there was <laughs> so many different ways back then. Yeah. He was, like, really into, like, <laughs> yeah. I, wanted, I always wanted to know it. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, you know, we're producing all those songs from way back when you were early on started. Did you always get your proper royalties back then or... Did somebody take advantage? Because you hear so many crazy stories of people taking advantage. Because, you yeah. know, you were doing Nas's first album, Big's mm -hmm. first album, Hov's first album. Did you actually get all the money you were supposed to? Yeah, at that point, in the 90s, because I I'd never had an attorney. Like, when I signed to to join Gangstar, I uh, shout to my man Lee Van Richardson, who told me in Texas, and when he looked at it, he said, dude, contract is not in your favor. I wouldn't sign it because you're signing your life away. But I just wanted to be in a video. I just wanted to be on MTV Raps at mm -hmm. the time. And I'm like, okay, I won't. Sign. Damn, Sign. You didn't even try to negotiate? Nah, because you're I just was so just, happy to be there. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm saying 20, you might have your I'm lawyer look at it and look, then be 20. like, can we change this? Yeah, I just yeah. turned 20, going on 21. <laughs> you know, you're just like, man. You're thinking, if I don't yeah. sign it, somebody yeah, else will. Yeah, and, my opportunity and I'm watching is. MTV Raps and all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, I just want to be on there with people. Like, I'm buying you because I saw your video. Right. So, I, and I, even my father's like, don't do it. As soon as they were not in my, I mean, I think I signed the same day at my <laughs> parents' house eating eating some lunch or something. Next thing you know, as it got to where I um, was having discrepancies about payments, and then I took it to a lawyer to look at it, and they were like, yo, this thing is airtight. You can't get out of this. Started looking for a lawyer on the a New York lawyer who was who was I'm still with this very day. Shout to my shout to Mark. And uh, he was like, I found a loophole in there that could probably get you out, but you're going to have to buy yourself out. I was like, I don't care. Like, we were, we were, they were interested in signing us at Chrysalis Records because we had done a record with Spike Lee from Obetta Blues called Jazz Thing. And Brand, that's how I met Brand from Marcellus to move in and how me and Guru moved in with him. That's how we met him because mm -hmm. he, uh, he was overseeing the project from Obetta Blues. And uh, so from there, Chrysalis liked our, liked our music. Said they wanted to sign us. The, the 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 majority of our money went to buying ourselves out. But now I had the freedom to just do what, what, how we wanted to do it, and we stayed with them all the way through EMI to Virgin, which was all still part of the same family. And that's how we uh, finally started to get some gold plaques and and things like that. But the best thing was, now that I had a really stir, a thorough lawyer, he's been making sure we've been straight from 1990 on. So you got all your your stuff back from the, oh yeah. no, no oh great. not 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 all the not all the, uh, all the other albums, they're still over over Universal, who's, you know, it's moved around from so many labels, you know, everybody sells this stuff, right. then somebody else acquires it, then they sell I it. I thought after, I, there was a rumor like after 20 years right. or something like that, you get your stuff back, is that true or no? It's, in some cases it is, yeah, like, like after a certain period, you can either buy, either buy them back or they're just now yours, it's really what you want to negotiate on your paperwork, but I, we have already been like, we're gonna look into getting ours back because it, it's been a while, and on top of that, we recouped all the time. It was Absolutely, even, we had you know getting 150 grand back in 1990 was like we're rich. Right. We got 150 thousand right, dollars. Right, right. Then the next one, uh, 175. Woo! <laughs> and splitting that with Guru and paying our taxes and st and living together, which was cool because 
you know, but he's getting two cars. I just bought my my second car. He's buying his third crib, you know, like Guru had a crib in Miami. Um, this is, and this is without us being platinum mm -hmm. and, and going gold either. And uh, that's how I met Zopound, mm -hmm. all of them way back in Miami. Like, like Guru had the jet skis on the water. He had the crib in Valley Stream in Long Island and he had a crib in Brooklyn. I was like, this is living. And we, we never cried broke because we always made money. Right. Always made money. And you were also really cool with um, Rage, the Lady of Rage. Oh yeah, so, she used to live by us. Oh really? Yeah. Then when when we moved into Branford's, she and Nikki D lived together from Def Jam. Mm -hmm. and Nikki D, you know, uh, Daddy's little girl. Daddy's mm -hmm. little. Girl. Yeah, yep, yep, they yep. lived together. I remember one time, uh, I met them because Nikki D was having her release party that Def Jam was throwing. We all went to the party, and I gave them a ride home because they lived near us. Chub Rock they used to live near us. We'd all see each other. Chub mm -hmm. Rock. <laughs> Uh, this is before Big, but still Rage, and we'd hang out. Easy Mo B would always come by. The RZA would come by. The Jizza would come by. Mm -hmm. Cypress Hill came and stayed with us before they went to their first video shoot for uh, How I Could Just Kill a Man. They had a, needed this place to hang out. Come, to, our house was the frat house, for real. Like, I don't feel like you see that no more. You don't see all. artists like that all the time, and yeah. this like you know you don't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it was crazy. Our house was a. You know, remember Animal House? Mm -hmm. uh, it was like that minus <laughs> jumping through the window and getting thrown out, but right. it just, it, our house was that crazy. You ask any of them, they'll tell you, our house was the house to stay at and hang out. It was party, 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 fights, shooting in front of our crib. Oh my gosh. Everything. And the neighborhood is so different now than yeah, it was back Yeah, yeah, people too. waiting outside the gate and I'm like, yo, who's that? And we all, <laughs> we were all strapped back then and we all just looking, yo, who's that? And, we all kind of go out there, yo, what's up? No, I just want to get my CD. Uh, you know, can you listen to my CD? And, and, you know, next time, some other hoodie dudes out there, we're all nervous, like, who's that? You guys want to give you my CD. It was always just somebody just wanting to hear, the, hear them rhyme. You know, Blase, Blase, you know, Out Loud and mm -hmm. PF Cutting. We'd all, everything on that song, Soliloquy of Chaos and the Daily Operation, all the names he said, that was really how we were rolling every time wow. we were mo making a move. How was your ego back then? Because you're a huge producer, right? Yeah. Were there ever times <clears> that you needed something from like an artist and they didn't come through in time? Like how was how was that for you? No, nah, we we were really cool with everybody. I mean, we had drama and fights just like anybody else over some knucklehead acting up, and we would wild out, but never to where anybody had like like some problems with us or anything. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, y'all think y'all hot? Man, fuck y'all. Never. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, the only one that was really a crazy story was when Guru got robbed uh, for his truck at gunpoint, and they took his brand, brand new Forerunner. This is when Forerunners was the new style was hot, mm -hmm. and they 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 robbed him for his Forerunner because he went to the store by himself. Oh, was this dude, Brooklyn Queens? Yeah, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Dude called him, took the took the truck. <laughs> I remember we had to go pick him up because he called us to tell us he got robbed, and and he's standing on the corner rolling a blunt going. Arguing with the other guys on the corner, even after they took his truck, going, you know, this is fucked up, this is what y'all doing, right? You know, this is really fucked up, y'all. It's a punk motherfucker. Like, they could have jumped him and beat him down and do whatever. He's still like, you know, I can't stand you, motherfucker. I can't see y'all. Believe y'all did this to me. And then the illest story, and I've told it uh, a few years ago, they're still, we're still looking for the, for the guys that took the car. You know, obviously, we, it was cell phones were only car phones at that time. Cause he had to call us from a payphone to tell us he got robbed. <clears throat> we they finally see the guy with the car. This is days later. So he's still driving around with the car. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's Brooklyn for this you. This is how Just to Get a <laughs> Rep was born. They're chasing after him in the car. Cops start going, burp, 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 you know, seeing all this high speed chase, and and they're like, he's, that's our car. He just stole our car. So now the cops jump in to help following the dude too. The dude's swerving and he slams into an ice cream truck and dies instantly. <gasps> Wow. And that day is the day we said that we're doing just to get a rep, and that's how the song was written. That day we went to Brooklyn to Such a Sound Studios and cut the record, and that's but that's why we did it because of that. Wow! So oh, just to get a rep is a true story. He, you know, he altered it like thing as we know things come back, and, and it wasn't about stealing a car, but it was relatable the way he wrote it. But he wrote it based off of, and the crazy thing too is when he got the car. I, I wish we had these pictures still. When he got the car, we both bought a, I bought a Mazda MPV, he bought the Forerunner. We're in front of our crib, posing like, yeah, we got our new ride. Mm -hmm. And then we're at the precinct, and the car is all smashed up like an accordion. <laughs> yeah. It's all squashed, and, and Guru's standing next to it going, 
<laughs> so he had the before, yeah, before and after. after. Did y'all have ins- did he have insurance on it? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yep. So but yeah, um, it was smashed up bad where you you couldn't have survived it behind the steering wheel. It was that smushed up. And but we went to the they, we had to go to the priest and just to fill out paperwork, but the cops were there as witnesses chasing the guy too and I, I you know, that that was a crazy, crazy wow. event. And you had quite an air for talent back then too, working with J. Rudy Damager, Group Home. Mm-hmm. What happened with Group Home? Dap is in is is out uh, is out I think in the Poconos. Uh, Melika I talk to all the time. I talk to Dap from time to time because obviously I got him to get on the Gangster album that we did in 2019, and uh, they they're all chilling. You know, they still get a lot of shows. Right. They've been going to Japan and they did a, they they did a Gangster Foundation tour with Big Suge, mm-hmm. uh, Group Home, and J. Ru. J. Ru was living in uh, in Germany. J. Ru out of everybody was the most that learned the business from us teaching him and seeing how we did it mm-hmm. you know and from that point he's he's got his own website he's you know he sells his own sneakers everything and he just stays r- really in, in the know he's That's promoting dope. shows and every, you know he's all you know his, his instagram is really interesting in the stuff he posts you know so he's still the same j rule mm-hmm. you know real mm-hmm. loud brooklyn boy yo pray you know he he, he, he talks like he rhymes I but gonna it, ask you, you know, with everything you you didn't did production for every artist damn near. Now, you know, you see law enforcement using hip-hop lyrics in courts against mm-hmm. artists. What are your thoughts on that? Because we see it with Young Thug, we see it with Gunner, we see it with a bunch right. of other artists. Yeah, what are your thoughts? they shouldn't do that because music is music. And yeah, some of the lyrics are harsh, a lot of them are real, and, you know, be, be it, be it uh, uh, fabricated or not, you, the, you can't really mix the music in there. Leave that alone and just deal off the stuff you know I mean, don't get me wrong, some people do be dry snitching on their lyrics, but right. I still don't think it should be used. Uh, you know, if that's the case, rock and roll, they've talked about how somebody said, oh, the, the song told me I'm the I'm with the devil and to kill everybody. Yep, and yep, yep. Same thing, you, you can't use that for Yeah, because we saw people go to jail for, like, doing scams, and they'll write a song about the scams that yeah, they did, yeah. you know, exactly, show the money in the video, and then they <laughs> end up getting arrested, and then they use that. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, the, yeah. I, the the music should be kept in, in its own lane, and the, the evidence should a, strictly be based off of what you have. Absolutely, yeah, from... yeah. Not with the music, no way. Now, who is your Mount Rushmore of producers? Um, definitely Molly Mall was just a big impact on me because of the rain you know, of the bridge. And, I see Molly Mall yesterday. How crazy is that? Yeah, the, the, at a restaurant, yeah, Queen. Uh, he's he's so man. He 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 just revolutionized sampling on a whole nother level mm-hmm. to hear a record like the bridge and i was just like how are they making it not sound all like all the drum machines we were using in hip-hop prior to sampling mm-hmm. how is he doing it you know and then uh him uh definitely the bomb squad um man when you when you don't eat and your, your stomach just keep growing <laughs> uh, we can't hear it <laughs> I, I i feel i feel like these mics pick up everything no, no, no. So it's like the bomb squad <laughs> uh, uh definitely the bomb squad what they did with public enemy was just amazing mm-hmm. um i got to say larry smith you know he did all the houdini records he did you know he did everything houdini records run dmc he would, from the time we heard Suck MC, he said, Larry, put me inside his cat mm-hmm. to laugh. Yep. And we asked DMC, was that true? He said, absolutely. Everything was was really what Larry did, and, you know, doing all the just classic records like that. And um, uh, you said Mount Rushmore is Foreheads? Four, one more. So Marley, Bomb Squad. Uh, um, I always got to put Dre in there for just him bringing a sound that we didn't even know about until I went to college. And I'm like, who's Easy E? And mm-hmm. you know, my friends from either the West Coast, it's like, yo, they put me on the Boys in the Hood, and everything they always just said Dre, Dr. Dre, and sometimes they would say Yellow, you know, on the side. But mm-hmm. I always put Dre in there. Uh, there's there's more than than the four, but I always put them in there because you know I'm a big fan of Rick Rubin, you know, and you know even you know from Knots and Showbiz and and you know even Pete and and the Lost Pro. But for what influenced me in the beginning, definitely Molly, the Bomb Squad, um, Larry Smith, and Dre. How do you feel about modern technology making producing so accessible? People using like, what is it, fruit, fruity fruity loops? loops? Yeah, and uh, Logic, and uh, it was a lot different when you were coming up and yeah. having to make beats. Do you think that the sound gets more watered down, or you think it's a great thing that pretty much 
Anybody could be a producer. I think it's just, it's just whatever works for you because uh, a lot of people ask me, which MC NPC should I get? And I'm like, the machines are useless without your mind manipulating it to do something. So it's just like, hey, I can, I can get behind a Ferrari somehow, some way, even if I don't know all the extra switches. I, I still know how to drive a car. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But and, and and I'm a deem I'm a race demon, so mm-hmm. it's like I it's the same thing. If I'm behind the wheel, <laughs> shout out to my man Panchi of the NYGs. He always says, "Yo, you have two modes. You have driving mode and you have airport mode." Because I've had to rush to the airport right before the plane's taking <laughs> off, and I will get Abby you knows. there. Yeah, yeah, I will get there. <laughs> even if I gotta go on the shoulder, hop, I'm gonna get you there. And even, you only have to go. Oh, look out! Look out! Look out! You're, you're gonna be fine. I well, what's your drive. preference, personally? Um, MPC became my preference. I started out on the SP12, just as 12 before there was a floppy disk. Then the SP1200 came out with a floppy disk, and and uh, I stayed on that. And then uh, all the way till uh, 1992, when I met Eddie Sancho, who worked at DND as an engineer that you had to hire when you just did a record. Uh, Showbiz was doing a remix for Lord Finesse. Uh, it was called Return of the Funky Man Remix, and they wanted me to do scratches. So, uh, show, uh, Lord Finesse booked the session. That's how I got to D and D. He's like, "We're going to be at the place called D and D." Show uh, had me lay the scratches. He said he had to leave. He said, "Can you get the mix and just bring me a cassette of the mix?" Mm-hmm. I had my sound system in the MPV. I listened to it and was like, "Wow, this is knocking." Boom, I said, we were going to go to Calliope where we did Step in the Arena and because of Queen Latifah, Jungle Brothers, Ultramagnetic MCs, De La Soul, they were all working there. And I was like, I want my stuff to sound more grimy and dirty like them. I did the first album there with Step in the Arena. We're about to get, we just got our budget for daily operation. I said, I'm going to D&D. Never left, the, left from that point. When, when we're recording the last song and we're about to work on Dwick, Mm-hmm. I did did it on that. No, what Take It Personal was the last song we did mm-hmm. uh, in in the A room. Everything was done in the A room. Uh, Eddie was like, "Yo, every the way you laying your beats down, you should use this." He said, this, "I'm about to sell it, but this is called an MPC sixty. And I said, "I know what it is." He said, "Well, let me show you what it does." He said, "It's almost like a tape machine without a tape." He showed me how the way I'm laying my tracks individual, and I was like, "Wow, I like this thing." Ended up doing that and did Dwick on it. But we couldn't book the A room. They put me in the B room. And I was like, damn, I want to do it in there. I've never been in there. I go in there, we do it, and just say, well, we'll do, when the, the, the day, when the room opens up, you could do maybe another mix in the other room. We mix it. Me and Greg Nice, Dub C was there mm-hmm. when we did Dwick. And Don Barron of the Masters of Ceremony, he came with Greg Nice. We did the record. It popped off. It was knocking. I was like, damn, the mix in here sounds better. From that day, I stayed, and that became Premier's room. The B room. From that point, and I've been on the MPC 60 ever since. I'm on the MPC Renaissance now because of the computer and more more memory time, but still, I'm on the MPC. Wow. You know. Well, we appreciate you for joining us. Hip Hop Thanks for having us. Volume one. Yeah. Joey Bass. This is our interview, Ricky Volume Mar, One. <laughs> Rhapsody, Nas, Run the Jewels, <clears throat> Lil Wayne, and Slick Rick. Yeah. Thank you so much about for about to shoot us. the video to, uh, with Remy and Rap. That's gonna be oh, fun. that's gonna be amazing. Gonna be they gonna be were talking fun. a lot of ish on there too. You know, I like yeah. that though. Yeah. yeah, they talk that talk. They both could spit. Yeah, yeah, man. and and that's why they're two different combinations of, of MCs. You know, rap is to remind me of kind of like the Lauren Hill <laughs> type of a, of a lane, and then Remy is just Remy. You know, so <laughs> she gonna talk yeah. that talk. So we, we're about to shoot the video to that. That's gonna be so much fun, man. We already got our, our, our how we're gonna dress already mapped out, mm-hmm. so it's gonna be be gutter. All right, well, yeah, thanks for it. having us. It's Primo DJ Premier. Yes, indeed. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.